it feels to me like we have copied and pasted psychology over theology, and we're more interested in the broken person than the sinful person. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. It's available wherever you get podcasts. If you like the show, please take a moment to review it on your favorite platform. Three times as many people are watching the show or listening to it this year as opposed to last year because people like you helped spread the word. Thank you for doing that. This is the show where I interview prominent thought leaders from various fields of influence to show how our worldview changes everything. My guest today is Rob Jackson. He's a licensed counselor with Focus on the Family's counseling services, and he specializes in issues related to sexuality, marriage, and parenting. In addition to being a counselor, Rob speaks at churches and national conferences on topics such as Christian spiritual formation, marriage, family ministry, addiction and recovery, pornography, pastoral care. He's earned degrees in music and psychology from Union University and completed a master's degree of science in clinical psychology at Mississippi State. Please welcome Rob Jackson to the show. Rob Jackson, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. It's fantastic to be here, Dr. Jeff. Thank you. We have had a number of people from the counseling world speak to our audience of the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. And people who are watching or listening right now, parents, grandparents, young adults, we struggle with these questions of identity. Who am I? I was just, before the show began, I was mentioning that I was just speaking at a school, hundreds and hundreds of young people there. And I said, look, you know, we, we all say that I don't need to seek the truth. I just need to speak my truth. How's that working out for us? Mm, we have higher well. levels of self-derogatory statements. You know, I don't feel that I'm any good at all than we've ever had. We have higher yeah. levels of anxiety, higher levels of aimlessness. 75% of young adults saying they don't have a sense of purpose that gives meaning to their lives. Right. That we, that we somehow believe as a culture that finding your identity within you, like it's some core that's in there, that if I believing if I believe in myself, that that somehow is going to give me meaning in the world. And you've got a devastated generation. And devastated families. Mm. It's hurting everybody. Mm. Well, we, we get a chance to talk about that a little bit, and I think we'll, we'll probably target very specifically talking about identity, having, having your identity in Christ, but we need, there is an obstacle that we need to face in our culture, and that is that people put their identity primarily in their sexuality, in their own feelings of sexual desire or their own sense that they fit some cultural category based on their sexuality seems to be maybe the biggest barrier that we face right now. I agree. And, you know, I was thinking back, I got into the field of helping predominantly Christian men out of pornography addiction 30 years ago, Hmm. 30 years ago this spring. And I've seen a lot of things happen, but I don't think I realized that identity was going to become like the core issue Mm. of this movement. I don't think I understood that we were going to get to a point to where someone said my sexual feelings, you know, equal who I am. And that seems to be truer of a younger generation, you know, and when I speak of the difference in our generations, I'd like to lead by saying I'm sympathetic to people of all ages, and I don't want to use age cohorts in any kind of discriminatory or prejudicial manner. And if our younger generations are suffering, well, I think we are having to look at ourselves as the older generation in terms of what have we left them with. So I'm very concerned. But I do believe, to your point, that Gen Z and the, the younger generations are more focused on my identity is in my sexual feelings. Yeah. I'd like to spend most of our show talking about the path to healing, but I really feel yeah. like we, we need to dig into that a little bit more. How did we get to the place 
where it wasn't just, well, like when I was a kid, I, you know, I liked girls. I wanted to, you know, I, I would have said, I, I like, I want to have sex. I like sex. I want, but it wasn't, it wasn't like I am a certain kind of person based on those feelings. Right. It was a very different sort of thing. It was unregenerate, you know, and I, I know mm -hmm. that I talked openly about this and had to, to re repent of this, but it's different now. And I'd love for you to describe the difference in how we got there. Yeah. I think if we back up even to perhaps the 1950s, there was a sense of, I want to be happy. Mm -hmm. Now that's not uncommon, but I think that generation really focused on being happy. And then I think that we've moved to a point to where most people are saying, you know what, I'm not happy. My circumstances are not happening very well. I'm not happy with my circumstances. In fact, when I consider my circumstances and I consider what's happened to me and how I feel about what's happened to me, I really, I really think I'm just broken. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a broken person. Mm -hmm. So I'd contrast happy versus healthy. You know, I wanted to be happy. Now I'm in a place to where she was. I don't think I'm very healthy. And what we've missed, Dr. Jeff, in both of those is a consideration the Bible brings back, which talks about our holiness, mm -hmm. the holiness that we have in Christ because of what Christ has done for the redeemed person. And I don't know that we are even prone to thinking these days about Christ and his holiness being ours. We're, we're, if anything, it feels to me like we have copied and pasted psychology over theology, and we're more interested in the broken person than the sinful person, mm -hmm. which we all are. We're all sinful. And I'm wanting to help people think through, if we see the kindness of God and how he will lead us to repentance, if we repent in his grace, there's going to be less to recover from. Mm -hmm. And we will also have a life that is moving away from what is breaking us, what is breaking us down. And when bad things happen that do break us from time to time, our identity is not going to be unbroken. Hmm. My identity is going to be unchanged. I am still a child of God through Jesus Christ. There are so many things I want to process here, Rob. It, it just occurs to me, first of all, that, you know, we do, we do have a generation that is maybe more transparent about what True. they're going through than in no, the past. But transparency that. is not the same thing as what you're talking about. That is not the same no. thing as repentance. No, no, there's no substitute for repentance. You know, there, uh, there's none. And so I talk about how we have three layers of sin to deal with. The first two are not our fault, if you will. The first is the original sin that your audience is going to be aware of, mm -hmm. the fall of humanity. The second would be the sins others commit against us. And I want to highlight, typically, it's okay for Christians to talk about how we have sinned, but it hasn't been okay to talk about how others have sinned against us, mm -hmm. because then we get charged with not forgiving others. But see, I yeah. want you to think with me about the developmental stuff. We're born in sin. We're born in original sin. And then we grow up, and we're very vulnerable and very dependent in these earliest years. And life happens. And mm. people do sin against us. Sometimes it's even on purpose. Mm. And mm. sometimes it's age to age and peer to peer in the playground. And sometimes it's much worse than that. Acts of perpetration and so on and so forth. And so we have original sin. We have others sins, and then we have to come back to our sins. We are not victims. You know, in Christ, we can see that he will use these things to his good, to his glory and to our good. And I don't think that's a spiritual bypass. It just says, well, you know, God works all things for good 
to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I know we have to be fully orbed in our theology and sympathetic to the person in front of us. But I don't think yeah. that verse is like a cliche. I think it's still true. Hmm. And so we're sitting with the wounded who needs to assess, are the wounds from generational sin? Uh, well, original sin, generational sins, other sins, my sins. And isn't Jesus Christ the answer for all of that? And I can do none of it without the person of the Holy Spirit. But in Christ, I can do all things. This is there's going to be so much uh, fun to dig into and talk about. Uh, I'm reflecting just because I always like to amplify the problem first. You know, th- this is a bigger question than than the ones we're asking right now. There's something huge mm-hmm. going on here. I have a lot of friends who are, you know, sort of all over the map politically, spiritually, and so forth. I have a sure. lot, of, and I, I have a lot of friends who are Jewish. Uh, we have mm-hmm. a, so many things in common. We have so many things where we differ. And, recently visiting with a Jewish friend and we were talking about this oppressor versus oppressed narrative, you know, right. it seems to govern all, the way we view political relationships and everything else. Yeah. And he said, I, he said, I think Christians are to blame for this. I think Christians are to blame. Really? Why? He said, because you celebrate Christ on the cross and it's led to this belief that whoever's suffering the most is therefore the most righteous. <laughs> and, uh, it's like, Oh, Great conversation opener. Yeah, let me, let me make sure. Get, let me get a cup of coffee first, and then <laughs> then, we'll, then we'll dig into it. Uh, you know, uh, there's a sense in which I see this happen. I see, especially people coming from a par- very particular perspective in the evangelical church today, mm-hmm. they do seem to believe and teach that your level of brokenness is your level of righteousness. Yeah. That if you, you know, and we even have this term for it, intersectionality. Mm -hmm. If you have one disability of some sort, that's bad. If you, if you have multiple disabilities, you know, you're a physically disabled person who has five different mental health things that have been identified and you're transgender and uh, you're poor and, you know, you're in a a physical minority, a, a racial minority group, then no one can touch you. You, you, you are the ultimate righteous person because you're so deeply wounded and such a victim at so many different levels. Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, I get that, Dr. Jeff. And to the point, you can't say anything else or that becomes another victimization of that person. Mm. There can't even be an honest, tell me more. But may I share with you, I'm not sure we're thinking the same way. I'm not sure that we're going to land at the same place. But I sure want to hear more about, about about you. Tell me your story. Yeah. Yeah. The the interesting thing is that, so, that somehow people have come to believe that their ability to articulate how they suffer mm-hmm. is their path to righteousness. It, like they forget the entire part of Jesus's narrative here that he conquered death and hell, rose from the grave so that we wouldn't have our identity and our victimhood. So true. And, you know, when I read some of the sort of the fathers of our faith, even going back two and three and four hundred years ago, they talk a lot about afflictions. And many had afflictions of a variety of types. And it wasn't like it was a badge of honor, but it also wasn't like, oh, poor me, I'm a victim, you know, is what is God going to do with this affliction? It is a school where the sovereignty of God is going to use the affliction in my life to make me more like Jesus. Mm. And in the end, that's bringing more glory to God. And subsequently, that's where I'm going to find my greatest joy. Mm. So it's, it's going to be important, I think, for the, for all of us to be cautious that we're not um, wearing our issues as identity statements or feeling poor is, you know, woe is me, I can't help myself, or look at how much I hurt. Let's compare how much I hurt to how much you hurt. Mm-hmm. You know, God can use affliction. It doesn't have to use, affliction doesn't have to use us. Yeah. Man, that's wise. I love it. 
Well, I think we, we, we can all relate to this. And, and everybody who's watching or listening would maybe have these struggles internally, or at least know of a young person who has mm-hmm. said something to the effect of, I identify as LGBTQ, right. or I identify as a transgender person. And, mm-hmm. you know, there are 50 different, 58 different transgender identities. Uh, that was at least the last time I looked at health, healthline.com. Uh, that was, uh, that was that was how many were listed there. Right. And, and so pe- people have not, it's, it's not even about sex, is it? It's like it, it's a, I have gotten the impression from young adults who are not sexually active that they still identify, they still have their identity in something that they think they feel about sexuality. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and interestingly, when you think about it, the sexual revolution that we started going through in the sixties, which has created all this bondage, you know, I mean, there's things that predated the sixties, but nevertheless in our lifetimes, it feels to me like there's been this emphasis on, um, sexuality being our point of identification. But when I work with men who are struggling with pornography, as an example, I always talk with them about, look, you, you know this is not really about sex, right? Mm. I mean, mm-hmm. you find yourself craving or you know, being compelled to use pornography and things of that sort. Maybe you've had multiple affairs or still even more virtual affairs. And you might think in the earliest days of your recovery, this is about sex. But let me tell you now, and let me remind you gently every day hereafter, this has never been about sex. You know, that is just the tip of the iceberg. That is a symptom. And so I feel like today when the younger person basically says, my sexuality is my identity, they're just basically doing what others have done before them. Mm -hmm. It is just getting morphed now into the language of gender as opposed to sexuality. Yeah. You know, biological male and female, you know, two types has become the, the dozens. Hmm. So now the word gender has to be dis- dis- differentiated between, you know, the, uh, the biological sex, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, you know, you would have to, you would have to be coming from another planet to not have seen this and worried about it, maybe worrying about it in yourself, but certainly in other people that you know. And one of our speakers at Summit Ministries, Christopher Yuan, regularly speaks mm-hmm. about having your identity in Christ yeah. rather than in your sexuality. Rob, what I love about the conversation that you and I get to have is, what does that actually look like? How mm. does that happen? Yeah. Walk us through moving from having our identity because anything could be a placeholder. If we say identity in my sex or my gender, Mm -hmm. it could be anything. You could take out the word gender and put in the word career. You could take out the word career and put in the word uh, athletic ability or or whatever it happens to be. How do you move from there to having your identity in Christ? For me, I think we even have to back up and talk about my identity first is I am fallen in my nature in an absolute rebellion against God, even if not at a conscious level. So my identity is I am a sinner separated from my creator. Hmm. And then we find, you know, the, the misery that comes with that, coupled with the grace where Jesus says, you know, let me lean into your misery. You know, let me exchange my holiness for your sinfulness, come be a part of this union that I have with the Father and the Spirit. So any talk of identity in Christ, I think, has to be contextualized in union with Christ, who is one of the three persons of the Holy Trinity. Mm-hmm. And I am amazed and dumbfounded and um unable to express the joy I have at the thought that the Father, 
the Son, and the Spirit are one. Yeah. And there is a holy society, a, a gentle conversation, you know, a loving environment that God has in himself. And so when we have our identity in Christ, we are a part of that fellowship. Mm. Mm. And that transcends male and female and black and white and other races and the educated and the less educated and those with money and those with less. That moves us from the natural to the supernatural. Yeah. See, I'm absolutely convinced that to be a Christian is to be in a supernatural relationship. Mm-hmm and to be involved in a supernatural religion. Mm. And these two go together. Yeah. Yeah. So So that's a starting point. It's all of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a starting point. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Well, so you, you got to begin by recognizing that your nature is as a sinner Mm -hmm. and that you are in need of the grace that is being offered to you. Uh, That's a message that I think a lot of people have heard maybe all of their lives. But the the, the culture is so powerful that it makes it difficult to even hear what that means from God's perspective. Like we're always imposing on it what we want it to mean or saying, oh, well, that's just church talk and that doesn't really relate to anything else. You know, and in the right. therapy community, I'm sure what you just said, fellow therapists would look at you and say, what kind of a nut are you? And uh-huh. how can you be a good therapist if you start off with an assumption like that? Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I began my master's program in clinical psychology at a state university, I went to our chairman of the department and said, may I hold some meetings? Uh, I want to invite my peers and and others, to come and have conversations about the integration of theology and psychology. And I didn't know how this was going to go over because there was no fruit that this man might be of a Christian persuasion. But he was open-minded and he was fun. And he said, sure, Jackson, go ahead. Well, I put my, my signs up. And I said, you know, come, you know, this time of evening at this location and let's talk about the integration of theology and psychology. My poster started coming down. I put them back up and finally my major professor came to me and she whispered in my ear. She says, you got to let this go. I said, let what go? These posters. I said, are you the one taking my posters down? Yeah, we cannot have this. I said, well, first I would have never put them up without permission. You know, I wouldn't have assumed the right to put them up, but I got the right to put them. I got the permission to put them up. What's the problem? So, yeah, I've fought this battle my whole life, uh, professional life, as a person who loves clinical work, sound clinical work, looking at the whole person, the spirit, the mind, the body, and the relationships, daring not to only spiritualize, but I would challenge the secular to not only psychologize. Yes. Right. Yes. Great distinction which you you come to when you have a larger a whole a whole world view not just yes. a reductionist world view that's right yeah. so for me it's like okay we now receive the grace to cooperate with our creator and live in such a way that agrees with how he designed us yeah and so if we go back and say he designed you either male or female based on his the mystery of his will, then would it not be wise for us to submit ourselves to his wisdom and his love and cooperate accordingly as a biological male or a biological female? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that one, therefore, of course, has to go get married and have children and a family, or that doesn't mean that the male can't be a music major as I was back in the day, or the female can't, you know, be an athlete. I mean, those stereotypes are, let them be dinosaurs, okay? (laughs) Let them be dinosaurs. But it's going to be so important 
for us to let God be God and realize this goes back to creationism. Hmm. When you have a person saying, I am dissatisfied in how I am at the core of my biological being, and I think I'm going to change that. It makes me think like going to some world-renowned museum and, and going into the to the art world and seeing something that you know a Rembrandt has painted and said, "Could I have some paint and brushes? I believe I'm going to improve on this a bit. Mm. Just just bear with me. Mm. I'm I'm going to make this better. Mm. We can't. Every person we ever encounter is a masterpiece. Wow." We talk about the Imago Dei being, you know, made in the image of God. Every person, a masterpiece. I just wish we all knew it in faith and yeah. lived it out accordingly. Yeah. And and living it out is something that you uh, you focus on a lot. What it means to have life in this in the spirit. Yes. yes. Not just physical life. Not just making it from day to day without your heart giving out. Right. But life in the spirit. I'd love for you to talk about what that means. Cause I think, you know, I know some friends who are like, that's a little weird. And other friends are like, that's all, you know, that's like they're Pentecostal. Like that's all we're going to talk about. So, you know, love to hear. (laughs) Yeah. I think it's interesting. We can start with words like inspiration, the Latin in spiritus in spirit Mm -hmm. may we have inspiration for what it means to be you dr jeff and me rob and whomever else someone else is inspiration uh enthusiasm the greek you know in theos in god i mean who doesn't need more enthusiasm today Mm. but we only need the genuine enthusiasm that god gives not the enthusiasm of Christian humanism or secularism or any other ism, you know? Yeah. And so it, it's how do we come to this place where we get fully engaged in the moment with the wonder of the creator saying, I know you, mm-hmm. yeah. you were precious. You know, you don't think so. Look at, look at what, happened on the cross for you. But you see, my concern, Dr. Jeff, we've got a generation that no longer even has command of the vocabulary we used to use in trying to evangelize and disciple others. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an interesting article and video called The Death of Sacred Speech and, you know, a, a dozen or more words that we have used in our Christian vocabulary has pretty well fallen out of the common culture. And so you use words like regeneration and justification and, you know, that, that P word propitiation. I mean, even a lot of people in churches today are like, what, you know, what are we talking about? And I remember years ago at focus sitting in a meeting and a man that I just love, he's such a, a brilliant mind. He said, I think we're headed to a place when we're not going to have the words we need to evangelize people Mm. because they're not going to understand the words we're using. And what I see in the LGBT community, they're masterful. I don't mean the individuals, but the movement is masterful at changing the words. Words matter, you know? So we're talking about in Christ. That's very different than saying I'm a person who goes to church. Mm Mm-hmm. It's very different than saying, you know, I, I know right from wrong. I have parents who will tell me, I, we raised our children in a Christian home. We took them to a Christian school. Uh, and all these things, you know, one more adjective, you know, Christian, 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 Christian. And I always want to be gentle, but I, I will remind people, you know, church is wonderful. But the church didn't die on the cross for your child or for me. The Christian school in full yep. support of it, hmm. but it didn't shed blood and could not for the sin that I'm guilty of or your child. Yeah. 
And knowing right from wrong, I mean, I, I think the enemy knows the Bible far better than I do. But the knowledge is not the same thing as transformation. Yeah. The knowledge of the Bible by itself doesn't transform the individual. The spirit does. Mm. And so I think whether we're talking about the clinical issue like depression and insecurity, or well, depression and the insecurity that comes from anxiety, or whether we're talking about some of these sexual concerns, or a midlife crisis, Mm -hmm. I think it's going to come back to God is bigger than we can imagine, and so is his love and kindness. But I know Dallas Willard talked about how it seems like in the American culture, the message of Jesus has become over-familiar to the majority, and therefore it has been brought down with contempt. Mm. And he was talking about how we need to find a new way to introduce Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got a few minutes left in the show here, and I'd love to continue digging in on this. I know people, when I share with people, especially if I have the opportunity to pray with them, I'll often Mm -hmm. um, pray that the Holy Spirit will guide them, will walk alongside of them. And I, I know that a lot of people, even those who aren't particularly religious or maybe they're Christian, but just haven't really given it a lot of thought Mm -hmm. seem struck by that and appreciate that. But I think it's still baffling. How do you do that? How would I know? Like I want to be the kind of person who is so sensitive to what's going on in my surroundings that I see what's happening spiritually and can respond at that deep level. How am I going to have How's that? How does that work for me? How do I? How do I do it? How do I walk in the spirit? I'm just curious what, mm-hmm. you know, how you do this in in your life, yeah. and 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 how this can help, especially this rising generation. Yeah. Well, I would have to preface. I do it very imperfectly, mm. and often erratically, <laughs> and mm. sometimes not at all. Mm. Well, thank you for saying that because that I mean, that's it's, it's that, true. Let's start. That let's start releases there. us from the tension here. Yeah, but yeah. I also find that when I have the grace to walk in the Spirit, is practicing His presence. Mm-hmm. There's peace. You know, I had a seven-year panic disorder that began when I was in middle school and lasted till I was a junior in college, mm. preparing for the music ministry. You know. Wow. And so it wrapped itself around daily panic attacks in a social context of eating in public. And I was just a mess. Okay. Mm. You know what I would have given for peace, Mm. you know, um, Proverbs 12, 20 talks about those who plan for peace have joy. And I have been learning peace with God is everything. It is the only thing. And of course, he gives it to us. It's not like our keeping score. Oh, I had a good day or a bad day, or I did this, or I didn't do that. But it is enjoying him for who he is, not just waiting to see if he's going to give us what we want. You know, it's appreciating that he is the gift, Mm -hmm. you know, and he has gifts to give also, but he's the gift, the primary he himself is the way of escape. You know, not that there's going to be some other escape, perhaps. And so if you say, what is it like to be in the Spirit and walking by the Spirit? I think it goes back to the fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, etc. Do we have a sense of I am receiving that? I mean, I still can't produce it. Mm-hmm. I can't produce any of it. I can't even hold on to it. Mm-hmm. But like a current that runs through a wire, I can be a conduit. And so I'm I'm wanting people to understand there is peace with God, and then he will help you to have more peace with yourself. And so if you tell me, I'm not satisfied in my skin, I'm not satisfied with my sexuality, I perceive my gender is something else, 
I want to meet you with love and respect and say, tell me more. Mm-hmm. And I am really sorry. But is it possible that if you took God on his terms and found that he is peace, that peace within yourself might follow? Mm-hmm. And then if you have peace with God and peace within yourself, more times than not, you're going to be able to find peace toward others. Wow, right. There will be exceptions, but more times mm-hmm. than not, even if that person is not able to be peaceful toward you, you're not going to forfeit your peace with God to get into that argument. Yeah. Mm. I love the way you phrased that. As I, I, I wish I, I would actually was asked this question yesterday about the fruit of the spirit. And I wish I would have approached it the way you just did that. I can't, I can't produce that, but God can produce it through me. Mm-hmm. I can't make that happen, no. but I can be a conduit for him making it happen through me. Right. So having, so yeah. thinking of your identity in Christ is not just that I have me here And I'm going to choose to identify in Christ rather than identify in my sexuality or intelligence or whatever. It is actually saying, God, would you be the source of my identity? Totally and only. I mean, I don't think that we're to to say, hey, my identity, you know, I'll use myself as a point of reference here, is a 60 plus year old white guy evangelical Christian, you know, run all the demographics. That's not my identity. None of that is my identity. All of it taken together is not my identity. You know, my identity is not whether I perform well or poorly, although I sure thought it was. Yeah. You know, I confuse self-esteem and self-worth for years. You know, if I'm performing well and you agree, my self-esteem is good. But if I don't perform well and you don't agree, or if I perform well and you still don't agree, Mm -hmm. now my self-esteem is bad, but self-worth is all about Jesus performing perfectly for you and I. Mm -hmm. And God the Father is saying, I am so pleased at Christ in you. Just as God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we'll never change His understanding of who you are in Christ is also steadfast and true, even when you don't believe it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Man, well, this really means so much that you would take us to this this deeper level of understanding. I, I, I do do sense that people want that kind of peace, that there's a hunger for it. Uh, but understanding what this actually looks like. Can can you, I know we just got a few minutes left, but I'd like for you to talk about this from the perspective of being a therapist, because you address mm-hmm. and talk about whole person care. Yeah. And it seems to me that this is a good place to to bring this up, not only so we can understand it for ourselves, but so that we can be helpful to others. I would love to do that. And so much of it becomes autobiographical because of the experience I had with panic disorder. I remember sitting in church, a Baptist church, not a Pentecostal church, asking for God to heal me, hoping that I would have enough faith to be healed, and it didn't happen. When I hear someone say, I have prayed to God that he would take away my same-sex attraction, Well, I pray that God would take away my panic disorder. Mm -hmm. I know what it feels like to want something to be taken away that plagues every minute of every day of your life. Yeah. And so I only have concern and respect for that. And growing up in the 70s, North Mississippi rural environment, There was only so much psychological help available. Almost everything was only spiritualized. And the thought of a Christian counselor would have been an oxymoron. Like, you can't really believe those two can coexist, right? So there wasn't much help available. And the pastors 
wouldn't be talking about the psychological and the physical. And if you would go to a therapist, they would only psychologize and not talk about the spiritual. You know, um, they might talk about some of the behavioral stuff, but nobody was addressing the whole person, saying, you know what, you're created in God. He is a Trinitarian being, you know, Father, Son, and Spirit, one one God. Here you are a person, and you have a spirit, and you are a spirit, and you possess a mind and a body. And just like the Trinity, you live in relationship with others. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, do you live in relationship with your creator? But we've already addressed that. In any event, you live in in relationship with others. How is your spirit relating? How is your mind relating? How is your physicality relating to the people in your life? And do you even know how to guard your heart? Do you know how to renew your mind? Do you know how to sacrifice your body in a Romans 12 kind of way and submit it to God who just takes it and uses it in a beautiful way? You know, do you know how to how to love others as God loves you. So I think all of this is fundamentally at the root of good care, whether we're addressing it clinically and professionally or whether we're addressing it ministerially and pastorally or whether we're just a lay counselor or one friend talking to another over a cup of coffee. Hmm. But in my experience, I got so sick with panic disorder and a Case of di- a case of mononucleosis that got diagnosed late, that the doctor said you can either go to the hospital and or go home. If you go home, you're going to do what I tell you to do, and you're going to have to have like six weeks of bed rest. Wow. And I'm in college. I've I've got an attitude. I got a schedule. I mean, I'm not wanting to have any of this, but I didn't have any choice. I remember trying to read my Bible one Sunday morning thinking I was supposed to. Mom and Dad had gone to church. I was left there by myself. It was a Sunday morning. I'm watching TV, and I'm thinking, this is not okay. This is not a time for a a Western. I'm Mm -hmm. flipping the channels. I come to Adrian Rogers from Bellevue Baptist, and he says, begin to do now what you believe to be God's will for your life. Mm -hmm. Begin now. I turned the TV off and tried to pick up my Bible. I actually, the way I was laying on the couch, couldn't pick it up because my liver was swollen with mononucleosis, and I had to let the Bible drop to the coffee table. And the first honest thing I had said to God was, God, really? What do you want from me? Hmm. The impression, you. I want you. Hmm. I just want to be in a relationship with you. That would be years before I would have some understanding of what that would look like and what that would become and what it would mean to me. But we have these spiritual issues that are complicated by mental health concerns that can be classic axis one diagnoses like yeah. anxiety and depression and axis two diagnoses. Some people have personality disorders like narcissism or antisocial personality or passive aggression. And a lot of that comes out of trauma and a reacting in the flesh as opposed to responding in the spirit. And we can go have these issues with our bodies and our physical constitution and health. And maybe we're not as tall as we want to be or we're not as whatever compared to someone else. And then we have different social abilities for being outgoing or being introverted, having energy or not enough. It's like you as a person or a table, you have four legs. One is spirit, one is body, one is mind, one is relationships. Mm -hmm. A stable table has legs that are equal in length and equally strong. And usually a person has a relative strength and a relative weakness among spirit, mind, body, and relationships. Mm -hmm. And if they're playing to their weaknesses, that creates one problem. If they try to play to their strengths, that can create another because neither of those approaches are looking to the Lordship of Christ. Yeah. And sometimes it will take talking to a pastor for the spiritual. It will take talking to a professional mental health person for the mental. 
it will take going to a physician for some of the medications and things that may be necessary. It may be taking time with a nutritionist or an exercise coach or working with the body and then yeah. even reading books about how to make conversations with people when you're otherwise uh, socially awkward. Right. Wow. All of it. Man, well, that's that's so helpful to see all those pieces come together. And I think it, it gives people permission to say, I think I'm weak in this area and I'd like to be stronger. And there is something that you can actually do. Uh, but I'm going to take away, you know, one of the key things you said earlier on is that this isn't even you doing this. This is God, you being willing to be a conduit through which he does. Absolutely. Life. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Rob, I, you know, with so many of these conversations, I don't expect them to go the, the way the way that they do, but I just know mm -hmm. that God works through the way they turn out. And this is going to be one of those shows. I think people are going to be so encouraged to feel like, oh yes, I can, um, I can relax. I can l live in the spirit. I can have the Holy Spirit walk alongside of me as my companion. And I can realize my identity in Christ. That's right. Your yeah. best friend will clarify your identity. Hmm. Love it. Thanks so much for being on the show today. You know, it's my joy. Thanks so much, Dr. Jeff. Thank you to my guest, Rob Jackson, for joining me on the Dr. Jeff Show podcast today. If you want more resources like this about the importance of Christian sexuality, marriage and identity, having your identity in Christ rather than in whatever the world says you need to identify as, go to summit.org slash resources for free articles, videos, eBooks, all kinds of things there. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to today's episode. The Dr. Jeff Show podcast is a resource of Summit Ministries. Summit equips and supports the rising generation to embrace God's truth and champion a biblical worldview. If you want more resources that can help you live out a biblical worldview as a student or reach the next generation as an educator, church leader, or parent, head over to summit.org slash resources to find out about the programs, the articles, the videos, the eBooks, and more that we offer. Also, if you're looking for more great podcasts that will build your faith and inspire you, our friends at Edify have what you need. You can find more podcasts, including the Dr. Jeff Show podcast, on the Edify app. Download it at edify.app, spell E-D-I-F-I, -I, and then you can also search for it in the Apple Store or the Google Play Store.